Well, welcome again to another podcast, Down to Earth, but Heavenly Minded. I'm your host, Irv Risch. And as we move forward, we're going to be going through the entire New Testament. Uh, and with that, we're going to do a commentary afterwards. And uh, with that said, let us just move on to our next section. And thank you for joining me. Chapter 18 At that time the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin! For it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, Cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father, who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep, and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault, between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. And since he could not pay... His master ordered him to be sold, with his wife and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant! 
I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Matthew chapter 18 11. The King Instructs His Disciples, Chapters 18-20 A. Uh, concerning Humility, 18 colon 1 6 Chapter 18 has been called the Discourse on Greatness and Forgiveness. It outlines principles of conduct that are suitable for those who claim to be subjects of Christ the King. 18 colon 1 The disciples had always thought of the Kingdom of Heaven as the Golden Age of Peace and Prosperity. Now they began to covet positions of preferment in it. Their self-seeking spirit found expression in the question, Who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? 18 colon 2, 3 Jesus answered with a living object lesson. Placing a little child in their midst, he said that men must be converted and become as little children to enter the kingdom of heaven. He was speaking of the kingdom in its inward reality, in order to be a genuine believer a man must abandon thoughts of personal greatness and take the lowly position of a little child. This begins when he acknowledges his sinfulness and unworthiness and receives Jesus Christ as his only hope. This attitude should continue throughout his Christian life. Jesus was not implying that his disciples were not saved. All except Judas had true faith in him and were therefore justified but they had not yet received the Holy Spirit as an indwelling person, and therefore lacked the power for true humility that we have today, but do not use as we should. Also they needed to be converted in the sense of having all their false thinking changed to conform to the kingdom. 18 colon for the greatest person in the kingdom of heaven is the one who humbles himself as a little child. Obviously the standards and values in the kingdom are exactly opposite those in the world. Our whole mode of thinking must be reversed, we must think Christ's thoughts after him, see Philippians 2 colon 5, 8. 18 colon 5 Here the Lord Jesus glides almost imperceptibly from the subject of a natural child to a spiritual child. Whoever receives one of his humble followers in his name will be rewarded as if he had received the Lord himself. What is done for the disciple is reckoned as done for the master. 18.6 On the other hand, anyone who seduces a believer to sin incurs enormous condemnation, it would be better for him to have a great millstone tied around his neck and be drowned in the ocean's depths. The great millstone referred to here required an animal to turn it, a smaller one could be turned by hand. It is bad enough to sin against oneself, but to cause a believer to sin is to destroy his innocence, corrupt his mind, and stain his reputation. Better to die a violent death than to trifle with another's purity. B. Concerning Offenses, 18 7, 14. 18.7 Jesus went on to explain that it is inevitable that offenses should arise. The world, the flesh, and the devil are leagued to seduce and pervert. But if a person becomes an agent for the forces of evil, his guilt will be great. So the Savior warned men to take drastic action in disciplining themselves rather than to tempt a child of God. 18 colon 8, 9 Whether the sinning member is the hand or foot or the eye, better to sacrifice it to the surgeon's knife than to let it destroy the work of God in another person's life. Better to enter into life without limbs or sight than to be consigned to hell with every member intact. Our Lord does not imply that some bodies will lack limbs in heaven, but merely describes the physical condition at the time a believer leaves this life for the next. There can be no question that the resurrection body will be complete and perfect. 18.10 Next the Son of God warned against despising one of his little ones, whether children or any who belong to the kingdom. To emphasize their importance, he added that their angels are constantly in the presence of God, beholding his face. Angels here probably means guardian angels, see also Hebrews 1 verse 14. 18.11 While omitted in RSV and most other modern Bibles, this verse about our Savior's mission is a fitting climax to this section, and it has wide manuscript support. 1812, 13 These little ones are also the object of the tender shepherd's saving ministry. Even if one out of a hundred sheep goes astray, he leaves the ninety-nine and searches for the lost one till he finds it. 
The shepherd's joy over finding a straying sheep should teach us to value and respect his little ones. 1814 They are important not only to the angels and to the shepherd, but also to God the Father. It is not his will that one of them should perish. If they are important enough to engage angels, the Lord Jesus, and God the Father, then clearly we should never despise them, no matter how unlovely or lowly they might appear. See, Concerning Discipline of Offenders, 18.15-20 The rest of the chapter deals with the settlement of differences among church members, and with the need for exercising unlimited forgiveness. 1815 Explicit instructions are given concerning the Christian's responsibility when wronged by another believer. First, the matter should be handled privately between the two parties. If the offender acknowledges his guilt, reconciliation is achieved. The trouble is that we don't do this. We gossip to everyone else about it. Then the matter spreads like wildfire and strife is multiplied. Let us remember that step number one is to go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. 1816 If the guilty brother does not listen, then the wronged one should take one or two others with him, seeking his restoration. This emphasizes the mounting seriousness of his continued unbrokenness. But more, it provides competent testimony, as required by the scripture, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Deuteronomy 19 verse 15 no one can measure the trouble that has plagued the church through failure to obey the simple rule that a charge against another person must be supported by the testimony of two or three others. In this respect, worldly courts often act more righteously than Christian churches or assemblies. 1817 If the accused still refuses to confess and apologize, the matter should be taken before the local church. It is important to notice that the local assembly is the body responsible to hear the case, not a civil court. The Christian is forbidden to go to law against another believer, 1 Corinthians 6 verses 1-8. If the defendant refuses to admit his wrong before the church, then he is to be considered a heathen and a tax collector. The most obvious meaning of this expression is that he should be looked upon as being outside the sphere of the church. Though he may be a true believer, he is not living as one, and should therefore be treated accordingly. Though still in the universal church, he should be barred from the privileges of the local church. Such discipline is a serious action, it temporarily delivers a believer to the power of Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus, 1 Corinthians 5 verse 5. The purpose of this is to bring him to his senses and cause him to confess his sin. Until that point is reached, Believers should treat him courteously but should also show by their attitude that they do not condone his sin and cannot have fellowship with him as a fellow believer. The assembly should be prompt to receive him back as soon as there is evidence of godly repentance. 1818 verse 18 is linked with what precedes. When an assembly, prayerfully and in obedience to the word, finds disciplinary action upon a person, that action is honored in heaven. When the disciplined person has repented and confessed his sin, and the assembly restores him to fellowship, that losing action, too, is ratified by God, see John 20 verse 23. 1819 The question arises, how large must an assembly be before it can bind and loose, as described above? The answer is that two believers may bring such matters to God in prayer with the assurance of being heard. While verse May 19 be used as a general promise of answers to prayer, in the context it refers to prayer concerning church discipline. When used in connection with collective prayer in general, it must be taken in light of all other teaching on prayer. For instance, our prayers must be 1. In conformity to the revealed will of God, 1 John 5 verses 14 and 15. 2. In faith, James. 1 colon 6 8. 3. In sincerity, Hebrews 10 22 a.m., etc. 1820 verse 20 should be interpreted in light of its context. It does not refer primarily to the composition of a NT church in its simplest form, nor to a general prayer meeting, but to a meeting where the church seeks the reconciliation of two Christians separated by some sin. It may legitimately be applied to all meetings of believers where Christ is the center, but a specific type of meeting is in view here. To meet in his name means, by his authority, in acknowledgement of all that he is, and in obedience to his word. 
no group can claim to be the only ones who meet in his name, if that were so, his presence would be limited to a small segment of his body on earth. Wherever two or three are gathered in recognition of him as Lord and Savior, he is there in the midst. D. Concerning Unlimited Forgiveness, 18 colon 21, 35. 1821, 22 At this point Peter raised the question of how often he should forgive a brother who sinned against him. He probably thought he was showing unusual grace by suggesting seven as an outside limit. Jesus answered not seven times but up to seventy times seven. He did not intend us to understand a literal four hundred and ninety times, this was a figurative way of saying indefinitely. Someone might then ask, why bother to go through the steps outlined above? Why go to an offender alone, then with one or two others, then take him to church? Why not just forgive, and let that be the end of it? The answer is that there are stages in the administration of forgiveness, as follows. 1. When a brother wrongs me, or sins against me, I should forgive him immediately in my heart, Ephesians 4 verse 32. That frees me from a bitter, unforgiving spirit, and leaves the matter on his shoulders. 2. While I have forgiven him in my heart, I do not yet tell him that he is forgiven. It would not be righteous to administer forgiveness publicly until he has repented. So I am obligated to go to him and rebuke him in love, hoping to lead him to confession, Luke 17 verse 3. 3. As soon as he apologizes and confesses his sin, I tell him that he is forgiven, Luke 17 verse 4. 1823 Jesus then gives a parable of the kingdom of heaven to warn against the consequences of an unforgiving spirit by subjects who have been freely forgiven. 18 24 27 The story concerns a certain king who wanted to clear his bad debts off his books. One servant, who owed him 10,000 talents, was insolvent, so his lord ordered that he and his family be sold into slavery in payment of the debt. The distraught servant begged for time, promising to pay him all if given the chance. Like many debtors, he was incredibly optimistic about what he could do if only he had time, verse 26. Galilee's total revenue only amounted to 300 talents and this man owed 10,000. The detail about the vast amount is intentional. It is to shock the listeners and so capture their attention, and also to emphasize an immense debt to God. Martin Luther used to say that we are all beggars before him. We cannot hope to pay, daily notes of the scripture union. When the master saw the contrite attitude of his servant, he forgave him the entire 10,000 talents. It was an epic display of grace, not justice. 18 colon 28, 30 Now that servant had a fellow servant who owed him 100 denarii, a few hundred dollars. Rather than forgive him, he grabbed him by the throat and demanded payment in full. The hapless debtor pled for an extension, but it was no use. He was thrown into prison till he paid the debt, a difficult business at best, since his chance of earning money was gone as long as he was imprisoned. 18 to 31, 34 The other servants, outraged by this inconsistent behavior, told their master. He was furious with the merciless lender. Having been forgiven a big debt, he was unwilling to forgive a pittance. So he was returned to the jailer's custody till his debt was paid. 1835 The application is clear. God is the king. All his servants had contracted a great debt of sin which they were unable to pay. In wonderful grace and compassion, the Lord paid the debt and granted full and free forgiveness. Now suppose some Christian wrongs another. When rebuked, he apologizes and asks forgiveness. But the offended believer refuses. He himself has been forgiven millions of dollars, but won't forgive a few hundred. Will the king allow such behavior to go unpunished? Certainly not. The culprit will be chastened in this life and will suffer loss at the judgment seat of Christ. Well, this ends another one of our podcasts. And until uh, next time, just remember, God is out here. And you can find out all about him in your Bibles. All you have to do is pick it up and read it. I have mine right here. And uh, God is in this Bible. So please read it. With that said, bye for now. Till next time.